Hallelujah, he is risen. Welcome to Easter Sunday with Third Reformed Church. We are so happy to be able to join you in your homes this holiest of days. And we thank you for joining us as we give you, even though it looks different, still a service to recognize the gift that we get from this day and celebrate every year in the grace and love that we received from the resurrection of Christ Jesus. So please follow along with us in the in-home worship guide. You can find that in the description below this video. Click the link to download that and it will have all the order of worship and the lyrics to the music for you to follow along and sing along in your homes. So to get started, we join Pam Lockwood with the prelude. Hallelujah, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Indeed, he is risen like the morning sun that brings light to the sky. Jesus is the light of the world. The light came into the world and the world came into being through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came into what was his own and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God. What has come into being in Jesus was life. And the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness. And this morning, church, we profess that darkness did not overcome. Hallelujah, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Indeed, he is our resurrection and our life.
Good morning. Hi, boys and girls. I sure do miss seeing you. I miss seeing you on Sunday mornings and calling you forward for children's worship and giving you a message before you go. So since it's Easter this morning, I thought I would give you a special message from my house. And I want to read to you a story today, a story called Jack's Hen. Jack's favorite hen, Polly, had died. He found her just before Easter. Jack's mom thought a fox had gotten in. Jack walked around sadly. Percy, the rooster, had survived, and Jack bent down to pet, pet him. Then something caught Jack's eye. Hidden in the straw was an egg. As Jack picked it up, he felt hopeful. Carefully, he carried the egg home and placed it in some straw in a box in a warm cupboard. His mom said the egg needed plenty of warmth. Mom warned Jack, it may not hatch. I don't want you to be disappointed. But Jack had a feeling that he wouldn't be disappointed. On Easter day, he noticed a tiny crack. After a long time of watching, he could hear slight tapping noises. Jack saw a tiny beak attached to the smallest, wettest chick, not much bigger than his thumb, break out of the egg. It rested but then it struggled out of the shell. Jack was too excited to even call his mom. Feather by feather, the chick dried out until it was fluffy and yellow, a perfect Easter chick. Jack called his whole family to see his Easter miracle. His dad clapped him on the shoulder. There are at least six Easter eggs waiting for you to find downstairs, said his dad. But you are more interested in this Easter egg some Easter eggs have surprises inside, but I don't know of any that contain real life like this one. Downstairs, Jack broke off a piece of chocolate Easter egg. I do love chocolate Easter eggs, he said, but my baby chick is really about Easter. Polly died and that was very sad. I won't forget Polly, but it feels like she gave me new life in this little chick. And when I watched the chick breaking out of the egg, it made me think of Jesus. I suppose that the cave where they put his body was a bit like an egg, for he broke out somehow, and he was somehow all new. Jack's mom smiled. Now you know why we give Easter eggs at Easter. Jesus broke out of the tomb to bring special new life to all of us. You've seen it for yourself this Easter, and I have a feeling I know what your little chick will be called. Jack nodded. Easter, he said. Isn't that awesome? Jack got this little chick, this new life on Easter morning. And we know that that tomb was empty and that Jesus is alive. Matthew 28, 6 says to us, he is not here for he has been raised as he said. Come see the place where he lay. That's something to celebrate not only today on Easter Sunday, but every day of the year, for we have new life in Jesus. Before I go this morning, I want to show you some new life that we have at our house. Just a sec. This is just one of the chicks that we have at our house. These chicks were born just one week ago. And you know what? It's a new life and it reminds me of spring and all the things that grow and all the new life in the springtime, but it especially reminds me of the new life that we have in Jesus. Remember that. In just a minute, you're gonna hear from Miss Allison Tietzma who's gonna give you the scripture story of Easter. And she's going to tell it in the form of a children's worship story, so you'll all be familiar with it. I miss you again. I can't wait to see you when we can all gather together at church. Happy Easter. The Lord be with you and also with you. This is the word of God. Jesus was someone who said such amazing things and did such wonderful things that people began to follow him. But not everyone loved Jesus or followed him. 
Some people hated the things that Jesus said and did. They wanted to be rid of Jesus, and they thought they knew just how to do it. Jesus was crucified and nailed to the cross. The people that hated him thought that was the end of the story. And his friends did too. They took Jesus' body down from the cross, put it in a tomb that was nearby, and rolled a great stone in front of it. Jesus was dead and buried. It did seem like the end of the story, but it was not. How do we know? Because some people say they saw him again, and they told others, and they told others, and they told others, until one day it was written down in the Bible. And now we can read their stories, the stories of the resurrection of Jesus. The Bible says on the third day after Jesus had died, on Sunday, some of Jesus' friends came to the tomb where they had seen Jesus buried. They found an empty tomb. The stone that had sealed the tomb was rolled away and the tomb was empty. Had someone stolen the body? But why would someone do that? They say that an angel appeared to the women as they were standing near the tomb. The angel brought a message from God. Do not be afraid, said the angel. Jesus is not here. He is alive. Go and tell the others what you have seen and heard. Mary Magdalene stayed near the tomb. She was crying. Someone said, why are you crying? At first, Mary did not know who he was. Then he called her by name, Mary. It was the way he had always said her name, and then she knew that she knew him by the sound of his voice. But the women were not the only ones with a resurrection story. Two of Jesus' followers were on their way to Emmaus. Emmaus was a village just a few miles from the city of Jerusalem. The two were walking and talking about all that had happened in Jerusalem. As they were walking, a man joined them. The man was Jesus. You would think that they would know him, but they did not. Not at first. When he broke bread and offered them some, as they were eating, their eyes were opened, and they knew it was Jesus. They say that the disciples were gathered all together when suddenly Jesus appeared to them. The disciples were frightened. They thought that they had seen a ghost. So Jesus showed him his hands and his side, the wounds of the cross. Then he even asked them for something to eat. They gave him some fish and he ate it to show that he was not a ghost. Finally, the disciples believed that it was Jesus and they were filled with such joy as they listened to Jesus try to help them understand all that had happened. These stories are told so that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. These stories are told so that you believe that Jesus lives. So good morning, church. Now, this morning, scripture comes to us from the Gospel of John with his telling of the Easter story. But before we hear that, I would love it if you would pray with me. Loving God, whose power is greater than that of sin and death. We thank you for the good gift of this day. 
for the explosion of hope that comes to us on Easter morning and the promise that life always emerges out of death. So meet us in this space and make this story alive in our hearts once again, that we might be changed and transformed by it so that we could look more like Jesus at the close of this day than we did at its dawn. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So hear these words from the Good News According to John, chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? And supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So language is an interesting thing. Uh, the way that we talk about things reveals how we feel about things. So a phrase that a lot of us have been using to describe this time during the Great Pause is social distancing. But I've seen quite a few posts on social media or articles that are floating around that push back on that language. Uh, they say that what we're really trying to do is physical distancing while maintaining social connection. And I can see their point. Not all of our connection as people comes from close physical proximity. We're returning to uses like telephones and letter writing. We're using newer things like social media and video teleconferencing to maintain some of those connections when we're being asked to isolate ourselves physically from one another. But I think that this crisis is helping reveal to us in maybe some new ways how we as social beings depend on connection, nearness, gathering together. And I just said that the way we use language reveals some of the ways that we think. In the Christian tradition, that connection between who we are as people and what we need with connection uh, comes through in our language. Church, or in the Greek that the New Testament was written in, ekklesia, means the assembly, the gathering, the community. Being together is what makes us Christians. And I would say even broader than that, being together is part of what makes us human. 
One of the things that I've heard repeatedly throughout this time of social or physical distancing, especially from those who live alone, is how much they miss hugs or any kind of physical connection for that matter. Because it doesn't matter how much you know that somebody loves you, it can be so valuable to experience that through physical connection. And so perhaps it's not all that surprising that this desire for physical connection comes through in the resurrection story as well. The resurrection of Jesus is an absolute centerpiece of the story of Scripture and of the history of the world. We have four different accounts of that first Easter morning. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John agree on the essentials, but the details don't all line up. I mean, they all agree that it happened on Sunday morning. They all agree that the stone was rolled away without human assistance, that the tomb was empty because Jesus was alive, that Mary Magdalene was the first witness, and that angelic messengers in radiant white are a part of the story. But after that, the accounts start to take some detours from one another. The details don't all line up. Matthew and Mark say that there's one angel, while Luke and John say there's two of them. The angels are either sitting in the grave or sitting on top of the rolled away stone or standing outside of the grave, depending on what gospel you read. John tells us that Mary Magdalene was there alone, while the other gospels say that she was accompanied by other women. Maybe Mary of Bethany, maybe Mary the mother of James or Salome, or just a whole bunch of women. Uh, they all agree that either Mary or all of the female witnesses who were there that morning were sent to bring a message to the 11 named disciples. But who exactly sent them and what exactly the message was changes depending on which account you read. And perhaps most curious is that Mark and Luke don't even have Jesus at the tomb. Uh, for Mark, he ended his gospel with the women fleeing from the angelic messenger, terrified. End of the story. Later editions of Mark's gospel have an extended ending added on, but that's a sermon for another day. Luke has the risen Jesus first appearing to two unnamed disciples on the road to Emmaus. Matthew and John, however, do something different. After the angelic messengers have finished, they have Jesus showing up at the tomb and appearing to Mary Magdalene, and according to Matthew, the other Mary who's with her. In Matthew, the two Marys immediately recognize Jesus, which is also a unique feature when we're looking at all four Easter stories. Matthew is the only gospel where the risen Jesus is immediately recognized. But that too is for a sermon on another day. What's compelling for me in these days of social distancing is what happens when Mary or the two Marys first really see and recognize Jesus for who he is. They want to hug him, to touch him. They want to know with their hands that he is really there with them. Having lost him three days prior, they want nothing more than to hang on to him in this moment. Matthew says that they come to him and they fall down and hold on to his feet and worship him. 
And then Jesus says to them, don't be afraid. Get up and go tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and I'm going to meet them there. So desire fulfilled, mission accomplished. Mary M. and the other Mary get to hold on to Jesus' feet while he's giving them instructions for what comes next. John, however, introduces us to social distance Jesus. In his story, Mary Magdalene is alone. And she is emotionally overwhelmed in the garden. Previously, she runs to get Peter and John. They come back with her. But having seen the empty tomb, they leave while Mary remains weeping. Upon seeing the two angels inside the tomb who ask her why she's crying, she reveals that she is not thinking about resurrection at all. She believes that some other group of people, they, have taken Jesus' body and removed it from the tomb. Immediately after confessing this to the two messengers in the tomb, she turns maybe looking for some clue, some sign. And immediately Jesus is before her. He asks the exact same question, why are you weeping? Before adding on, whom are you looking for? Mary pleads with him, uh, sir, please, if, if it's you who's taken him away, just tell me and I'll take him away. And it's at this point when Mary has made it clear that her only desire is to be near Jesus, even if that means picking up his cold, dead body, if that's what it takes to honor him in this moment, that Jesus has mercy and calls her by name. And her name on his lips opens up her heart to his presence. She recognizes him in the speaking of her name. She calls him teacher and moves to embrace him. But Jesus doesn't allow it. Don't hold on to me, he says. In the second week of social distancing, which honestly feels like, I don't know, two and a half years ago now, our family drove to Holland to wish happy birthday to my mother. My mom is a breast cancer survivor and she lost a lot of lymph nodes and endured a lot of chemo and radiation, which puts her in a high risk category during these times. And as we dropped off some gifts for her and stood six feet apart with my parents in their yard, there was absolutely a sense of joy and connection at seeing them, just being able to talk to them in person. And yet the first thing that was said in our car when we pulled away was the unusually soft voice of my youngest child saying, it was really hard not to hug grandma. Yeah. I feel you, buddy. And I imagine that that's some of what Mary Magdalene felt in the garden that morning. Shock and joy at the presence of the risen Jesus. And yet a certain pain at not being able to embrace him. I've always been puzzled by this detail in the story. Jesus says, do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father. And man, over the years, I have read a lot of commentaries and done a lot of pondering around that phrase. And I have yet to come up with a truly satisfactory answer to the reasoning for his statement. There's just something about this time between the resurrection and the ascension that requires Jesus to practice social distancing, even from one of his closest disciples. As John's gospel continues, we see that that doesn't just continue perpetually. 
Um, it's interesting that in John's gospel, the resurrection, the ascension to the Father, the giving of the Holy Spirit, and the commissioning to continue his work all happens on the same day. And so we see Jesus later that same evening breathing on the disciples and saying, receive the Holy Spirit. We see Jesus inviting Thomas to put his fingers in his wounds. We see Jesus sharing a meal on the shore of the Sea of Galilee with the disciples. So clearly he doesn't keep that social distancing forever. But here in the garden, Mary is denied the one thing that she instinctually longs for. An embrace. John writes in two different spots near the end of his gospel that Jesus did many other things in the presence of his disciples after the resurrection that are not recorded in the book. And I, for one, hope that one of those things was to give Mary Magdalene a hug, or at least to let her hold on to his feet while he gave the instructions. I like to think that as the very first witness to and preacher of the resurrection, she got that embrace that she longed for. But I also trust that if she wasn't able to get that while Jesus was still in this world, that she'll have her moment in the world to come. I trust that the same will also be true for us. The New Testament is insistent on the fact that the resurrection of Jesus is a bodily resurrection. And because he's the first fruits of the resurrection from the dead that we all will share in, that means that our resurrection will be embodied as well. I will never try to convince you on the physics of this, as irrational as it is, but I believe that when the kingdom of God comes in its fullness, we will all have an embodied social existence with no distance between us. This great pause and the separation that it's requiring from us will pass. Hugs will be given. Embraces will be shared that will remind us in our bodies that we are loved and that we've been missed. And hopefully we will have a renewed sense of what it means to be truly social beings connected to one another. Hopefully we will never take for granted again the gift of gathering. The great promise of the gospel is that our time of physical separation from the risen Jesus will pass as well. As we say every time that we are gathered together at the Lord's table, we share in a feast of hope, looking towards that day when the risen Jesus himself will set the table before us. And maybe on that day, Mary Magdalene will be the one to break the ice as we all give in to that longing within us to hold and to be held by a risen Savior. I want to thank you once again for joining us on this Easter morning. And I'd encourage you in the comments below the video this week to share any ideas or thoughts or phrases that stood out to you in this message, or even more broadly, to share how you're experiencing Easter in the midst of the great pause. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? 
Were you there when they nailed him to a tree? Were you there when they nailed him to a tree? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they nailed him to a tree? Were you there when they laid him in a tomb? Were you there when they laid him in a tomb? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble. Tremble, tremble. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there when he rose up from the grave? Were you there when he rose up from the grave? Oh, Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when he rose up from the grave? Good morning, and on this glorious Easter day, I invite you to pray with me. O God Most High, all praise and thanks belongs to you for your loving kindness. We praise you always, but on this day of resurrection joy, we give you special glory for the glimpse of new life and eternal life you gave us through the victory of Jesus Christ. We join with the universal church of all the ages as we thank you that Jesus Christ became a servant and gave himself up to death to show the depth of your redeeming love. We thank you that he once having died and once raised shall die no more and that over him the grave had no power. We praise you that to all who trust him, he opened the doors of abundant life and life eternal, and that now because he lives, we become alive in Christ. All thanks be to you who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Almighty God, whose Son sent forth apostles to make the good news known to all nations, fill your church with resurrection power. Pour out your spirit upon all who minister in Christ's name, all pastors and missionaries, and all who serve you in other places like education and business, government and public service. Grant that all of your people abiding in the source of life, may be bearers of your light and grace and blessing. Merciful God, in this most unusual and unprecedented time throughout the world, we commend to you your loving care, all who are in any way afflicted. Relieve the burden of suffering, Restore health and vigor to the sick and the weak. Let the bur heavy burdened find strength to endure. And those who are walking through valleys of deep darkness, that they may see the light of your divine presence. 
give to those in sorrow or loneliness the assurance that nothing can separate them from your love. And may those who are the dying and isolated from family and friends find themselves in the friendship and the care of Jesus. On this Easter day, when many of us are wanting to be with families in church and certainly at the dinner table, but we cannot, we are more mindful then of those who cannot because of their life circumstances. And we intercede for those who have a different calling upon their life that forces them to be working today and so many other days. And so may your mercies attend the paraplegic, the chronically psychotic, the sufferers of contagious diseases, the bedfast elderly, the prisoners, the homeless, the unsung heroes who are our doctors and nurses, the pharmacists, the ambulance drivers and EMTs, the fire and police personnel, the funeral home owners, the public servants of all kinds and places. And may all those who serve in thankless tasks, those kinds of people that we don't often think about, be reminded, may they be reminded that as they serve others in Christ's name, that they are serving Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Third Church, for this family of believers we call our home. Thank you for our love and care for one another and for the many ways it's being demonstrated while we are absent from one another. We are your church, certainly when we are together, and we are your church when we are scattered through our cities and towns. Keep us strong, keep us faithful to you and to each other. And O oh God, may the deep truth of Easter dawn in our troubled world once again. Remind us of the meaning of Christ's death and resurrection over all the forces of evil. And take from us all pride, all selfishness, all greed, anything that keeps us from seeing you and honoring you and loving you. And now hear this prayer and the silent prayers of our hearts as we offer them in the name of him who is not among the dead, but lives among his people, even Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Good morning, church family. If we haven't met yet, my name is Kate Fan, and I have the privilege of serving as the Kids Hope Director at East Leonard Elementary School. I wanted to bring you a few community updates this morning and let you know at this time, both Kids Food Basket and Mel Trotter Ministries have temporarily suspended on-site volunteers. Kids Hope has a new challenge of still mentoring our students as Grand Rapids Public Schools is navigating online learning. Supper House is unable to serve meals at this time. However, NECOM, our food pantry partner, is experiencing a higher volume of clients at their site and could use some additional financial support. A few ways that we can still uh, reach out to our community would be to pray for the organizations and staff and the clients that they serve. Another might be to send a note of encouragement or thank you to the organizations and staff. And a third would be to give online to NECOM. You can do that directly on their website by visiting NECOMGR.org. That's N-E-C-M gr.org. Our family would also like to extend a very happy Easter to everyone and let you know that we miss your faces and hope to see you all soon. Bye. <laughs> Hallelujah, he has risen. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Hallelujah, 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 he is risen. Hallelujah, he is risen. Hallelujah, he is risen. Hallelujah, he has risen. Hallelujah, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah, he is risen. 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 Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Hallelujah, He is risen. Hallelujah, He is risen. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Hallelujah, He is risen. Hallelujah, He is risen. Hallelujah. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. He is risen. We cannot wait until we're gathered back together in the sanctuary for worship. But until then, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face upon you and grant you peace. Amen.